Well, welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it is great to get out here in the, the middle of a sort of gloomy Friday and uh, sort of a transitional period between sort of a wet, clammy fall and a nice, crisp, cold winter coming on. We're, we're in that transitional period. So we're, we're sort of also in a socially transitional period in women's ascendancy, I hope. And uh, so I'm glad that we can talk about that. Uh, a little, I'm going to start off with a little bit about Bernal and a little bit about me. And I'm not, after that, going to take you so much through a, a uh, journey of emotions as I am going to take you through a journey of logic. And I hope to give you some information that you, you will take and use to forward what you think are the, the messages from uh, our time together. Now, Bernal has been around for 135 years. Brunel was founded 135 years ago in Gainesville, Georgia, right after the Civil War. And there were several other women's colleges around the South that were founded in that period of time by forward-thinking people because there was a shortage of a particular resource after the Civil War in the South. What was it? Men. It was a very local issue in, in several areas, especially in small hamlets that that had men who had gone off to particularly gruesome ends and gruesome battles, they found themselves without traditional leadership, and they weren't going to import men as they were, would import bricks or, or, um, or um, trees. They said, we've got to provide a resource, and they did that. And I say in a very few select areas, because these people were forward enough to think beyond the norms of the time and think that women could be leaders. So for 135 years, Bernal University has in, indeed believed and empowered and equipped and supported and stood with the women that have come through our doors. Now today, we, we are no longer this women's college in Northwest Georgia. We are Bernal University with about 3,000 students, 900 of whom are the heart and soul of our university, which is the women's college in Northwest Georgia. But we've grown around that and expanded the reach. And I think that that's one of the reasons that Bernal Women's College con continues today. In the 1960s, there were over 350 women's colleges in the United States. Today, there are about 48, with the number decreasing annually. One of the problems is market, market share, availability of funds. And Bernal managed to, to supplement the, the re tuition revenue in the women's college with other tuition from our graduate programs, our health care areas, our business programs, and, and, and hence we've been able to support our core and heart. But I think you find that Bernal is informed by our women's college and our, and our heritage there in all the things that we do. So it is, it is both my job and my pleasure to be the president of Bernal because it has so much of a rich history and it's dear to my heart. But why is it dear to my heart? Why do I care about women's education anyway? I do have some economic and financial reasons for that, but I also have some very personal reasons for that. That's my 92-year-old mother on the left with my daughter on Christmas morning last year. Mother's looking at a digital uh, picture frame, and my daughter is instructing her how to use it. Mother attended for one year one of those women's colleges that no longer exists. She was born and raised in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Her father was a lawyer, and she was one of seven children. She had uh, great aspirations of being um, um, a writer, a poet, a language teacher, and she went off to Randolph-Macon. Uh, within a year, her father died from a heart attack, and she had to go back home and work as a clerk because in those days, her mother, who had been so successful at raising children, had never been educated or taught to do anything outside of the house. She, she felt incapable of doing so. And she, she called mother back and other, other uh, of her sisters who were working or at other schools to come back home, go to work, and help the family stay alive. 25 years later, mother, when I was in uh, the sixth and seventh grade, finished her undergraduate education became employed as a school teacher, and then over the subsequent few years later, uh, received her master's degree in um, comparative literature and, and creative writing. 
So she did accomplish those goals. It just took her longer. I won't talk about this today, but I will tell you, because I can see you are a diverse audience. We're going to talk about traditional age women and the need to educate them and offer opportunities and support for them in the South. But there is just as much, if not greater, need to educate people like my mother, who are 25 years into their lives, careers, and are looking to better themselves, their families, and their circumstances. The impact that we can make in traditional age uh, women is only multiplied if we look at the whole range of women who are essentially one person family leaders. My daughter is on the right. She's an OBGYN. Um, she was one of the few women in her uh, area of specialty in undergraduate school in, in biology. Um, she went on to Wake Forest Medical School and did a residency at Wake Forest. And you know, at the time she went through residency, Men were still the dominant sex in OBGYN world? Is that not crazy? It's not so much today. But when she went on to medical school, men were still dominantly the, the largest number in the, the entering uh, medical school class. That's not true today. And that's all changed within about 15 years. My wife, uh, Myra, has the Christmas tree sweater on. She's a mathematician. She was one of the very few women in graduate school mathematics. That has changed a bit, but STEM uh, degree paths, science, technology, engineering, are still restricted, not only by self-selecting. You hear folks say that, well, women just don't want to do this. That's bull. People don't want women to do this, and they're not encouraged and supported to moving into areas with which they've not been comfortable in the past. We must have women uh, as the center and core of STEM sciences if we're going to move ahead as a country. On the left is my daughter-in-law, Brooke. She's a pediatric dentist. She, she, they just began practicing a few years ago. She today represents a change in the medical community because a majority of, of, of individuals entering medical school and dental school today are women. So in the time between my daughter went to medical school and when Brooke graduated, that ratio changed to be consistent with the ratio of women and men in college in general. My granddaughter, one of four, Abby, is someone I passionately do not want to see have to experience my mother's turmoil. She should be able to compete and ascend to her own capability and potential without artificial boundaries or social constraints applied to her or my other three. I need one more for a basketball team. <laughs> okay, so why should we educate Southern women? There are moral reasons, there are social reasons, and we can talk about those at other times. But I'd like to talk to you about financial and economic reasons. The South, specifically the area from Delaware through Texas, has the largest number of traditionally aged college-aged women not attending college or any higher education of any section of the United States. We have the biggest problem and the greatest opportunity. There we go. If you look at it numerically, the South has 3,100,000 women who do not attend higher uh, institutions of higher education of any sort. And you can see the rest of the states have substantially less than that, even uh, no one is above two million of, of their uh, traditional population of women not attending school. Now I'm going to propose to you, and I can say this, Catherine Stockett, author of The Help, visited Bernal a couple of years ago. She's from Mississippi, I'm from Mississippi originally, and we were exchanging ideas and comments about being from Mississippi. And she said, you know, one time she was in New York beginning the, the uh, book tour when The Help came out. She was at a cocktail party and rather self-righteous gentleman from up east walked to her, up to her and, and, and told her that he was just so sympathetic that she had had to grow up in the South and it was such a horrible thing and, and that she, he really felt sorry for her. And she took offense to that. And she said what I say, you know, I can say that because I've lived here, my parents lived here, my great-great-grandparents lived here, and I know how we got to where we are and where, maybe how we can get out of where we are. But you don't look at it and learn. 
I think there are two problems in the South. Rural communities tend to perpetuate, not innovate. Rural communities tend to learn how to survive and sustain based on what they've done in the past. And they're afraid to change because, as an earlier speaker said, things evolve, capabilities evolve, and, and they evolved into a certain society. But what worked in the 1800s doesn't work in the 21st century. And we all know that if you look at political offices, you, you look at publicly elected uh, prestigious positions, the ratio of men to women. Now tell me that that represents a, an intellectual ratio. Tell me that represents a potential ratio. Or what does it represent? It represents a social, cultural, or religious bias that's influenced the voting and the nominating and the winnowing process. We also know that women in the South receive less pay for equal jobs, and they also receive less opportunity to advance uh, within the structure and leadership of their organization. Go to every regional bank board in the, the um, southeastern United States, attend a meeting of the Board of Trustees, and tell me how many women you count in the room. Okay, there are financial reasons. If one half your team doesn't play, the game is, is forfeited. If, if on the other hand, you know that every individual who uh, completes a four-year baccalaureate degree adds one million dollars to the lifetime earnings capacity of the nation, then how could you not encourage more people, women or men, to complete college. These are the actual statistics. The South, the South drags both percentage and in absolute numbers behind all of the rest of the states. California and New York are the individual states with the highest levels of traditional age women uh, engaged in higher education, but none of the southern states, according to this is 2012 data, come close. Now, that's, I'm not saying that to accuse the South. I'm saying what a great opportunity we have if we turn the trends around. These are the annual and lifetime earning capabilities of women. These are, the data has been removed, so there are no male salaries in here, of women who've attained these levels of higher education. If a woman drops out of high school, she will probably make $20,000 or less in a year. If she finishes a four-year degree, on an average, in the South, she'll make close to $50,000. In a lifetime, that's a million dollars difference earning. If you look at unemployment, a woman who, who was making $20,000 a year as a dropout only has about a 87% uh, uh, chance of being employed because she's in the, uh, the largest unemployed segment in the United States. And if she has a four-year degree, she has less than 5% unemployment pool to live in. Her employability is greater and her earnings are greater. Next slide. So if you take just the South and look at the actual number of women that you could put to work if we supported them and if we encouraged them and if we got them the capability and the wherewithal to attend higher education of their choice, you would, by taking those people who dropped out of high school and those people who have only high school degrees, add $2.4 trillion to the American economy. What's the national debt? It's less than that. So what's going to make a politician any happier than increasing the tax revenue without increasing taxes? All you have to do is invest in the best economic development tool you've got, the available pool of women in the South. Now this is a critical graph. I'm running over, so I'm, but I'm going to I'm going to tell you about this graph. There are two, there are two curves, one in, in green and one in gold. On the left-hand side of this, this graph is the number of years in school. This relates, by the way, to an individual, a group, a family, a nation, and a globe. It is true in every group you look. The more years you spend in school, the green line is earnings, then the more money you will make as a person, a nation, or, or a world. Makes sense. The more years you spend in school as a person, a nation, or a world, the lower your birth rate is. 
There are lots of reasons for that. But the most important reason is that when women are educated and capable of not being uh, tied to someone else's earnings, then they can make their own decisions about family size, about reproductivity, and what they want to do with their lives and what's the best for their family. But when they are tied to someone else's earning capability, then their choices are limited or eliminated. So education is not only economically freeing, it is personally freeing. So this is my last slide. The Sun Belt is growing exponentially. We are growing so fast that even during the recessionary plummet, we were growing. Now as the economy comes back, we're growing even more. We do not have the number of employed, tax-paying people to support the growth and services necessary for the next 50 years. You know, if we don't get this opportunity for our women pushed forward, what's going to happen? We cannot su survive both from a social standpoint or an economic standpoint. So the South, as much as I said about it negatively, we have a history of love, of nurture, of caring, of compassion, of stepping in when someone's in need. Well, why don't we take that and make it the biggest economic development tool that you can imagine? Well, you invest in a factory, it rusts. You invest in a computer, it becomes outdated. You invest in the education of Southern women, and it stays with us through generation after generation. I think that's the cause that we ought to be engaged in together, and thank you for listening.